videos. Awesome. The recording. I know Adrian, people are jumping on. So hello, Stefan. Hello, Naomi. Hello, Nick. What's up, Ty? How, how's it going, family? I'm driving to AZ right now. Just I can hear you all. Nice. We'll drive safe. Love it, love it, love it. So I'm thinking that Adrian will be jumping on here any minute. We're going to have the rest of the group jump on. I'm just taking a look here, make sure I didn't have, okay, cool. Naomi, can you hear us okay? Yes, sorry. All good. All good. There's Aaron jumping on. All right, looking good, looking good. Let's do this, let's start off with some wins. Who's got some wins for the month? I know we're in the third, third or fourth week, depending on how you count your weeks. Third or fourth week of September, who has some wins, things you're excited about, things that are working well? Uh, I can start off, so uh, closing escrow yesterday. Uh, have some really big deals that are pending. Uh, got a really good hot seller lead off of the divorce divorce list. Just call on that. And, you know, the guy's like, hey, you know what, Robert? Um, yeah, we're going to have to start doing something. So can you come over this Saturday to take a peek at it? And, yeah, so that, that was just a great call. But uh, just a lot of people that are out there at least interested in having conversations. And like you guys always preach, Ty, data, you know, make sure that you want those those data points that you're, you're going to get a hit off of. And that's what did it today. Love it. Great job, Robert. Love it, love it, love it. What's up, Adrian? What's going on, ladies and gentlemen? We got the one and only Mr. Zuber in the building. Damn, I got to get me one of those hats, man. <laughs> we can arrange that. I'm going to print the logo right now and just, <laughs> just stick it on your forehead. Stick it on my forehead. <laughs> <laughs> Good to see you, Michael. T-Y-L-G, what's up? Thank you. I love it. I love it. I love it. Good to see Ali. Good to see Tino. Good to see Luis, Naomi, Elizabeth, Aaron, Joe, Robert, Angel, Stefan. Nick's connecting his audio. I love it. Andrew Kim in the building. What's up, brother? Hello, Rosie. Rosie's connecting audio. I see the audio. Good afternoon, Rosie. All right, who else has some wins? Things that you're excited about, things that are working well. Here we are, we're almost to the fourth quarter. Go for it, Aaron. Just got uh, just got a seller multiple counter offer signed right now. We'll be opening escrow this afternoon. So that was a really yeah. good one. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It's that's a, and you know, that was only on for, it, it wasn't a matter of hours on this one though. It took a couple of weeks to get it going, but it, uh, it happened, so I'm happy. And, uh, you know, we've, and they come, they're even removing appraisal contingencies. So it's pretty sweet. Love when they do that. Sweet. Yeah. Love it. Love it. And you're representing the listing? Yes. Sweet. Yep. Great yep. job. Great Thank job, you. Great job, Aaron. Love it. Oh. And he's got a new listing coming on the market that he was talking about this morning. So. Yep. And that's coming on, too. That's going to be live on October 1st. So they're just getting a lot of the work done on that. That's uh, two homes on one property. Pretty good. I mean, it has 1,500 square foot building on it. Just a, this is a great, great little property. And it's, a, it's two acres. They're both manufactured homes on permanent foundations. So it's, yeah, it's going to be a nice property, nice rental for someone too, I think. So if anyone looking to get a couple properties on one, on a, a couple homes on one property. Yeah, but I have a pretty good month overall, man. I got three closings. I'm about to have three pendings. And uh, yeah, I have two, two active listings so far. So I'm just uh, got to finish strong. Let's go. Yeah, thanks to this group. Thanks, guys. Hey, work, work, dude. Thank you. Love it. Who else would like to share? We got time for one or two more. What's up, Terriel? Terriel's good to see you. Glad you're here. Anyone else wins? Can I talk about our our deal that finally closed on Friday? 
<laughs> well, tell it, tell it, tell it. Oh man, this lady had a hoarder house and it was actually through our, our door knock deal. I'll share if you don't. Seven. He's in outer space, folks. <laughs> Jeff, I don't know if you can hear us, but your audio was really breaking up. So come on, stand like by, stand far. by. Naomi's going to share and then we'll come next to you, Steph. Okay, I'll make it quick. Anyhow, it was a lot of back and forth. The seller almost pulled out a couple of times, right, Ty? And um, mm -hmm. finally, I think she even got paid yesterday, I heard. So she checked her account. She's very happy. She's out of there. She actually moved out to the hotel and then she moved back in because she didn't get paid and she finally moved out. So we're we're done on that one. I'm very happy. Yeah. <laughs> you guys, so you guys closed. She didn't get her money. So she's decided she would move back in until she got her money. Yeah. <laughs> this lady, this lady was trying to cancel every other day. Every other day, it'd be like, nope, she's canceling. And there were other investors just swarming her house like vultures. And they were like doing all the slickster stuff like, oh no, we'll give you, we'll give you two grand more. We'll give you five grand more and all this stuff. And um, anyway, and the whole, the only reason the deal was even delayed was because she was in pre foreclosure. Like Michael talked about, she had been, hadn't made a payment in, you know, 1700 days or I don't know, <laughs> something stupid. Right. So it took a long time for the, uh, trustee, the attorneys to get the attorney fees, the payoff demand, the reinstatement. The, it took a long time to get it all together. But meanwhile, we'd have these investors <laughs> just go into her house, door knocking her or popping in. <laughs> Great job, Naomi. Yeah. <laughs> as long as you guys got it closed. I love it. I love it. When you said I she moved it. back in, though, I was like, geez. Woo. They, they asked me, I got to send wire instructions. I didn't even send my wire instructions because I just wanted to make sure that get the deal and get the seller paid. So uh, I'll distribute probably, let's say Thursday on that. So I, I've had that happen a few times this year, but they didn't move out. They, no. to, they chose not to go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I love it. Steph, can you, are you in range? Is he, I don't, can you? I don't know, can you guys hear me? There you go, go for it. Yeah, yeah, we got uh, three closings at the end of this month. Uh, we locked up three more deals this week, and I got a call from one of the sellers. We were thinking he was trying to back out, and he said, oh, I have five other properties we want to sell. So it's, uh, it's been awesome. And then Keegley, uh, my partner hadn't done a deal in six months since I came on board and built the team. We uh, got three locked up in the last week as well. So it's Nice. Good job, Steph. Love Let's it. Let's go, Steph. Great job, dude. Love it. Love it. So, Adrian, we're going to toggle back, and you just let me know if you want to. Do you want to take the wheels, Adrian, or do you want me to take the wheel? It's up to you. Whatever. I, I could chime in from time to time. It's all you. So why don't I do this? I'll set it up. So we're going to get into the call now. So we're, we're very fortunate to have Mr. Michael Zuber here on the call. Give it up for Michael. So Michael is a great part of our community. Um, just a total go-giver, as we all know. Um, I have the good fortune on Fridays, Michael, every Friday, Michael and I record a financial news. And really, it's me just picking Michael's brain for 20 minutes on what's happening in the economy, financial news, as it relates to the real estate industry. So that's a big thing. It's not just financial news, it's how it relates to the real estate industry. Um, in terms of, you know, I've been going to boot camps and seminars and gurus and, uh, you know, spending a lot of money. I know Adrian does, we all do. Everyone here, we all invest in ourselves. I got to say in the three de in the three decades that I've been spending money investing educating myself I've got to say that Michael is the highest value guy that gives just an absolute ton um, gives so much away for free on his YouTube channel on his Facebook groups on his Instagram all of the stuff the guy just gives 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 but here's the beauty he has his finger on the pulse and when I say that why does Michael have his finger on the pulse because he's in the game. He's in the game. He owns 
I don't know exactly, but my last count, it was 100, 170, 165, 175 doors. Okay, is that pretty good? In California, by the way, is that pretty good? So, and he's always on the gas and growing. So Michael, thank you for being here. No, thank you, Ty. And uh, I say it every week. I look forward to our Friday conversation. It allows me to get out of the daily grind and really think about what we just happened in the last, you know, seven business days that impact the lion's share of my, you know, personal net worth. So I love talking real estate with you. You always got great questions and we just, you know, it's, it's just a fun conversation every Friday at 10 o'clock. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. So I'm going to tee it up and I'm going to, I'm going to ask the first question today, what we want to focus. I didn't even set this up with Michael. Like I didn't pre-frame it at all, but what we want to talk about is a fourth quarter forecast. Mm -hmm. What's going on in the real estate economy. What do you see from your crystal ball, mm -hmm. all the data, everything that you're looking at. And then the second part is that we talked a lot about like, and then the second part of it, and, I, and I'm pre-framing this also for the audience that, you know, what should people be thinking about to get their first deal mm. or potentially their next deal? And, and specifically, Michael, like the whole idea of one rental at a time. So I'm going to tee it off right now today. What do you see the market doing here in California? And just kind of maybe share some of the stuff you see with rates and such. Yeah. So the Q4, so Q4, the next, what is that? Three and a half months or so, I guess three months in a week. It's kind of a continuation of what we talked about the last two months. The housing slowdown is real. Most of you probably are seeing increased inventory in most markets. Uh, you're seeing a slowdown in open houses. Uh, the best properties are still selling. They're likely going fast. They're likely going over asking. They're waiving appraisal conditions. But what was very common in April is not common in August, right? It's, it's all listings aren't getting 40 offers in 40 minutes, right? It's a different market. It is occurring at different rates in different cities, even within California, right? Uh, maybe LA is different than the Bay Area. That's different than Sacramento. But it's pretty obvious that inventory is growing. So uh, inventory growing is not a bad thing. It is not a bad thing, but it is a thing. And generally speaking, what we also suffered through most of July and August is we saw a good portion of approved buyers who were active take a couple months off. They're like, I'm done. I'm pissed off. I'm going to go vacation with my kids at Disneyland or I'm going to Vegas or whatever they wanted to do. Right. So lots of agents that I spoke with said, Hey, Michael, I had 15 approved people that were rock and roll. And now I've got five. Now those folks are coming back, right? Unless they signed a lease somewhere where they're going to be in an apartment or a house for a couple, a, a year, most of those buyers are coming back. So what we're seeing is rising inventory. The buyers are coming back from a, a July and August break. We are seeing some sellers, frankly, push agents around. Some sellers are demanding very high prices. Maybe you come in, I'm just going to make up numbers at 700. They want 800. And they're just dead set on it because their neighbor got 800 in April. They want 800 now. And of course, April and August are different markets. So we are seeing some inventory sit. Days on market is expanding. And that's really because uh, some very high price listings for, for what the value should be, just extend the days on market. So in the end, we're going back to a more balanced market. Uh, we're probably nowhere near an actual balanced market, meaning six months on, of inventory. I think in California, the average market, like a balanced market is far closer to four, right? This market moves at a different rate than the rest of the country. But still, we're at like two and a half months, which again is trending in the right direction. It's not one and a half months like it was, you know, just four months ago. Uh, so in the end, uh, you know, generally speaking, it's slowing down. Also, as agents, and, and likely some of you may be locking up deals, you have just a unique point of history. Uh, you have a time in history that I've only seen one or two other times in 20 years. You actually have potential for motivated sellers. There are things going on, especially in the landlord community now, that might make older landlords say, I'm done. We had an eviction moratorium for much of the country. Now 42 states are evicting. California is not. I fully expect our lovely now governor who survived a recall to extend it. Right now it expires October 1st. I'd be shocked beyond shocked if he doesn't extend it till January 1st. There are going to be some mom and pop landlords that cry uncle and say, I'm done. On top of that, there are talk of higher taxes next year, which could really impact us. If you're a California landlord and you own more than a couple, you know, you're looking at potentially paying 40, 50% in capital gains. So there are lots of reasons for mom and pop landlords to sell. 
I would be making calls. In fact, I haven't personally done a mailer in like four months. I'm having my team do multiple mailers to a list of landlords in my market, which is Fresno, California, that's owned property for 20 years or more. And I'm going to say, hey, I'm the one rental at a time guy. I've been here since 2002. If you've ever thought about selling, let's talk about seller financing. I can save you on taxes, remove headaches, all that stuff. So we're sending out thousand bucks every other week in mailers to everybody on that list, which is about 993 people, I think, just short, just, just under a thousand. So I'm being very specific, uh, but there's a lot of things going on to be as investors to be excited about. Uh, I think we are headed for uh, years of inflation and we've been giving a gift of low rates, R low rates last week and actually three weeks in a row were 3.03% for the 30 year. I don't see those going up much, certainly in the next four to six months. So what am I doing? Because I always, I always do when I talk, right? So I just went and took a couple of my assets that I own free and clear, and I'm borrowing money. I'm getting rates at 4%, 3.99, which is great for me. Maybe not great. You know, maybe you, all of you can get better. I can't. That's the lowest I can get on a cash out refi. I'm getting 30-year money on pretty much everything I own, so I can have a lot of cash ready to deploy if things go, go hinky because inflation's going up, even in California, right? Everybody remember Gavin Newsom set rent control, uh, I think AB 1408 or whatever it was, uh, but it was always 5% plus inflation. Inflation's over 6% when you look at CPI. So even in California, we're going to be able to raise rents 11, 12% uh, next year. So rents, rents, rents are going to go up. And uh, if you have fixed rate debt, which is I recommend, uh, you're going to be doing okay. So um, I'll stop there and see what's what. I love it. I love it. I love it. Adrian, follow up question. So, yeah, and I wanted to save this a little bit later, but you mentioned the governor, and I, I just want to ask something. Sure. How do you see they recently made that SB the nine SB, and ten? Yes, that's going to convert single family houses that are within a zoning of transits to go mm -hmm. to four units. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Uh, well, yeah, they can basically go multifamily. I don't know if it's three or four. It was kind of fuzzy. I've only read it once. I actually just did an interview with Aaron Norris from the Norris Group or Property Radar. I guess he's oh, a Property wow. Radar yesterday. So that just posted. We talked about SB9 and SB10 plus California Crash 2.0, just to tease three videos that went out yesterday. But yeah, SB, SB9 is interesting. Um, you know, I have a lot of houses, Adrian, that I'm looking at going, huh, half a mile with the transit line room. So I'm intrigued by it. Um, Aaron, who is big into ADUs uh, for California, he did a lot of research. He actually expects SB9 as written to have a bunch of changes in the next six or nine months because there's owner occupant requirements and things that make it bad for me, right? I'm not, I'm not going to live in Fresno, right? But he expects those to change as they modify it going forward. So he's intrigued by it. Um, I think, uh, you know, if I'm an investor, I go look at those and go, huh, can I create a mailer here, right? Can I go find lots over 12,000 square feet? No, I would look for something large, no pool. That's what I'd be looking for, right? Because if there's a pool, they've probably really, they, they've, they've already carved up the, the land, right? Um, but that's what I'd be looking for. Large lot, uh, no pool. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'd take a shot. And certainly if you could buy it today, the land's probably going to be worth more. But SB10 might even be more interesting. SB10 is this up zoning. Right. I actually have several properties, and we talked about this in the video yesterday, that might be able to be bought as houses, right? They're R1, knock them down and put up a 10 plex. That's kind of interesting, right? So uh, I definitely got to go figure out the upzoning. So I think, I think SB10 may have more upside, but you're going to have to hunt for where they're upzoned. It's going to be much smaller, but probably worth the effort. Uh, SB9, I think, will go through an evolution. It, but getting rid of single family zoning is about to piss a lot of people off for sure. Um, but it's, it's one way to get some, some additional units. So uh, I guess I'm waiting for the change because once you make it owner occupied only, it's like, well, I'm not doing that. Right. Right. And, and let's say they, they remove the owner occupied only. Do we see opportunity zones then changing drastically? Probably. Yes. Do we see like Boyle Heights still being opportunity? opportunity will will the normal opportunity zones still be opportunity zones or will they naturally gravitate and shift to transit areas 
I suspect they're going to, tr- I would, again, it'll, you know, the, the legislation's not, not even written yet, but my suspicion is they'll move to transit. That, that's where the, that's where the investors will go. Cool. Yeah, that was my biggest, because I saw that. And then obviously that's going to play a big mark. That's going to play a big role in sellers. I'm assuming we're going to see a big seller spike from that. I'm assuming we're going to see a hike in, well, just the same thing, right? Inventory in certain locations. Do we see that also staying in California for like, you know, we got Terry in Utah, we got some guys in different states. Do we see that going to different states? Is that only California? Um, again, I'm, I'm, it's, I'm probably not the best person to ask. I've lived in California for 50 years and nowhere else, right? I've lived within 10 miles of where I'm talking to you from. So uh, I don't know. I would ask them. I mean, California, certainly the Bay Area and LA has an acute housing affordability problem my suspicions is other states aren't as acute there is land right so I, i'm probably not the best person to ask that no worries no worries no worries beautiful i appreciate that it, my my next question is about inflation how do mm-hmm. we see uh, yeah i know like the rents here in orange county they were my neighbor just leased for like ninety five hundred dollars oh, and and it was not ninety five hundred dollars last year yeah right okay. Yeah. How, I guess my question is, is in the higher end markets, it's mm-hmm. squeezing out it in essence, it's squeezing out the middle class from buying a home. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. How are we going to see that change and affect our market over the next 12 to 14 months? Well, I think what, I think what is happening and I go back to that work I did on that 50 year spreadsheet that I think Ty and I've talked about a couple of times. I think what's happening is, is at least as of the end of 2020, housing was never more affordable when you take incomes versus interest rate versus payments. However, down payment, right? The down payment to get into a house is a problem, especially in California. So what I suspect to happen in this you know, $3.5 trillion spending bonanza that they're talking about, there's going to be some first-time homebuyer credits. Uh, there's going to be a lot more talk of house hacking. I talked to a mortgage guy every Wednesday, Matt, Wednesday, Matt the mortgage guy. And he just told us November 15th, uh, you can get a conventional loan, 95% LTV for house hacking, duplexes through quads. Uh, you have to be 80% of area income. But I think there's more and more understanding from the powers that be that it's not a payment problem. It's a down payment problem. So I expect a lot of people to focus on the down payment. You're on mute, Adrian. Do you see them extending the length of loans to be able to allow more more purchase power? Like uh, going forward. Yeah, I do. I think that's atrocious. I'm. I think. I think. I think thirty years is long enough, and you, most people get by in their early thirties. The average age of first time home buyers thirty one. I like to see people own them free and clear when they retire. So it kind of makes sense, um, but nobody's asking me. So yeah, I fully expect the 40 year to be a standard option in less than five years, might be less than three. Interesting. I heard a, a verb or another verb, a talk the other day mm-hmm. and they mentioned the word mortgage is broken down as a mortgage. It's pretty much a debt till death is what yeah. mortgage stands for. Mm-hmm. A debt till death. I didn't know that. Interesting. Yep, it is. Yep. I love it. So speaking of mortgages, let's talk about, so here's the thing. There's a lot of people out there and it's interesting because when I talk to just general conversations with people who've been around the block, Mm -hmm. oh, there's no way that interest rates can stay this low. The rates are going to spike up and that's going to cause a market crash. We've talked about (laughs) this too, right? Yeah. we've we've, We've talked about this till we're blue in the face. We're not in a crash. I don't necessarily think we have to spend a lot of time there, but I want you to explain for the audience why? Why are interest rates going to stay low? And what are the indicators, the financial reports and indicators that have us to believe rates are going to stay low over the next three to six months? Well, first and foremost, we, we can never forget, you know, probably for the, you know, probably the rest of my life, I, I'm willing to put it out there, that the dollar is the reserve currency of the world. That gives us very unique standing that we cannot underappreciate. For example, the last year or so, people have been telling me that China's coming up. China's coming up. China's coming up. The, the yuan, the renminbi is going to you know, be, be the dollar replacement. It's going to be on par. Well, has anybody been paying attention to what's going on in China the last six months? They're crushing tech. 
they're punishing wealth. They want to, they want to declare common prosperity. They want to be the largest socialist country on the planet. Now they're going to let their property developers go belly up called Evergrande, the largest, the second largest on the planet, $300 billion. And now they're hurting the average citizens. They got three, 3.5 million employees. When you add up all the other agencies, it's, Nobody's going to want to deal with China, right? The, the rules are changing. They were communists. They had they had capitalist tendencies. Now they have declared, as of I don't know, a month ago, when G, G, I think his name is, said we're going to have common prosperity. They're going to be the largest socialist country on the planet. So their currency is going to take a back seat. There's no rule of law. They can they the, the central government, basically a party of one, can change his mind in a minute. You know, and right now, what's happening? People are struggling to get dollars. Why did gold fall the other day? When, when this uh, uh, company had a problem? Well, they were selling gold because China's been sucking the gold market from Australia, but all of a sudden they didn't, they, you can't pay off your debt with gold, they needed dollars. So they sold gold to get dollars. And right now what they're doing is they're gonna make, they're probably gonna punish external capital, meaning, hey, if you're Citigroup or Chase or whatever, and you, you lent to our, this, this big property developer, where you shit out of luck, you're not getting paid back. And that's just going to raise the cost of capital for all of their developers. So we're going to see a cascading event over there. And um, yeah, the, dollars, the dollar is the cleanest, dirty shirt, if that makes sense. And there's nothing, there's nothing even remotely close that could replace it. So uh, that's why. So when, when everybody is scared, the dollar gets stronger. The, the Dow was down almost 1,000 points yesterday. What was up? The dollar. It's just kind of the rule rule of life, certainly for the next couple of decades. So that's where we're at with that. Talk about to the, um, the, and by the way, I want everybody here. I see a couple of questions pop in the chat. I want everybody, we're going to open it up here in a minute. I'm going to ask just one more question and then I'm going to pass it to Adrian and Adrian will do a follow-up and then we'll kind of just, whoever has questions, right? Adrian said today, everybody come with two or three questions today, right? Cause we've got Michael Zuber here. Michael, so talk about too, like the jobs, how does that, like, that was something big that I've learned from you is like how the job report seems to really have a lot of influence yeah. on that. Talk about that. Yeah. So again, one of the beauties of having looked at the market for nearly three decades, having an econ degree and be able to break down what kind of fed speak is, is about a year ago, Jerome Powell changed the order of priority, right? Every Fred president that I have been an adult to watch it was always inflation first, job second, right? They always talked like it was 1A and 1B. All of us know you can only have one priority. You can't have this 1A, 1B. You can call them whatever you want, but you got one. Jerome Powell in the last year flipped them. And he flipped them publicly. So it's not like he's hiding this. He's like, I'm going to be the jobs Fed president. So he is focused on that. So what happened? So I think it was July. We had a barn birder job growth. It was like 961,000, largest in decades. Now people are talking about the economy's overheating, the economy's overheating. We got to taper, we got to taper, got to raise rates, got to raise rates. August jobs number, atrocious. 236, I think, on like an 800 expectations. Huge miss. And what does Powell do? See, I told you, I'm the jobs guy. Jobs aren't good. So rates are going to stay low at least through the year because he wants to see, he basically wants two Julys back to back, a million and a million. He was close, but August didn't hit it. So it starts over. So if September, which is the month we're in, comes out great, which will be reported the first Friday of October, that, you know, nothing happens until late November because he wants two months in a row. So yeah, the jobs are a big, I mean, if you just watch, if you were watching one metric, it would be monthly job creation. Uh, and that will tell you what uh, Jerome Powell is doing. And right now he's like, I'm on pause. Job market's not coming back. Delta's running crazy, blah, 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 blah. So yeah, the jobs creation is a big deal. Got it. Got it. Love it. Adrian? Witness protection. <laughs> turn, off, turn on your cameras. <laughs> Terrell, Nick, Marlon, Joe, Rosie, Tino, Stefan, Nick, Jose, Zach. Andrew, come on, guys, let's go. Turn on your cameras. We, we had it this morning. I like got on the call, fired Michael, because I'm like, we all need uh, to be on our cameras. We need to be participating. I'm just curious because everybody has their cameras on now. Does anybody own 200 units who doesn't, who has their cameras on? Like anybody, anybody own close to 200 units? Adrian, I can't start my camera. 
It says right, the host. Stop. I'm assuming that those that are on witness protection have so many units that we don't need to participate. So I'm just hallucinating. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, nice. it's big. So question, just because there's a lot of agents on the call, mm. knowing what you know, mm. what would you be doing as a real estate agent to really grow your business in this market? Seeing the numbers that you're seeing, seeing the opportunity that you're seeing, seeing the different changes that are occurring in the real estate industry, what would you do as a new agent right now for your business? Well, I, you know, again, I've never had that job or career. So this is just, it's just my expectation after working with hundreds of agents. So with that oh, qualifier, right. um, I believe in the, the simple phrase is if you're new, it's list to last. So what I would be doing is reaching out to, again, I always give my playbook away. It's probably a stupid thing to do, but I would try to reach out to every, uh, I would look up every uh, landlord who's owned property for 20 years or later, and I would call them, right? I would call them and I would say, hey, I'm, you know, Joe Schmo, and uh, I understand you own a bunch of rental properties in the area. Uh, just curious, how has the last year been? Uh, evictions, did you see any hit from that? Do you understand that taxes might be going up next year? Have you ever thought about listing? Maybe you get a listing, maybe not. But worst thing you do is you make a contact with somebody you know owns a lot. You practice. Generally speaking, we older landlords, we don't mind talking about what we got. We're pretty open. We're not mean. Uh, we, you know, we're happy to build our network. Uh, those would be the easiest things to do. As I would, I would, I'd go get a list for whatever zip code you want to focus on, and I would try to call everybody who owns four or more units in that zip code. That's what I'd be doing. That's huge. With the intention to eventually own one their one of their own. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean, what I I mean, really, what I'd be doing is I'd be fishing for a seller finance deal with zero down. But that's just me, <laughs> right? I would try to buy every property I can with zero down seller financing. And if you build a good enough relationship, I've done it. I've bought apartment buildings with zero down seller financing. Just have a conversation. The one thing I would tell that I think wholesalers get wrong is they always tell me I'm marketing to sellers. I'm marketing to sellers wrong. You're marketing to owners. Treat them as owners. Be respectful. Appreciate that nine out of 10 to get a hundred of these a day. Treat them as owners. That'll buy you 15 seconds or a couple of minutes on the conversation. And you never know where that goes. I get, I just got, while I've been on this call for 33 minutes, I got three wholesaler calls, right? I don't, I don't even bother picking them up if I don't know the number anymore, right? Don't be that person. Call and, and realize you're talking to an owner, not a seller. So good. I love it. I love it. Questions from anybody on the, uh, from anybody out there, whether you guys put them in the chat and or raise your hand. Uh, Elizabeth. Oh, I don't have the, uh, okay. yeah, Yes. Hi, Michael. Hi. Pleasure talking to you again. Yes. Hi. Um, quick question for you. I know you mentioned about you seeing that a recession may be coming sometime next year. And you also mentioned about stagflation. Mm -hmm. Do you believe we're going to go into recession or stagflation? And how will that affect us in real estate come mm -hmm. around a year, year and a half, two years? Because we also have to be thinking ahead and planning ahead, not just the right now. Yeah. So that's a very good question. It's funny. Nobody's asked me that yet. And I put that, I've been putting out these notes for 30, 45 days. So kudos to you for that. So first off, I would argue we're already in stagflation. It's oh, just wow. not been reported. That, and, and again, economic reports are always in the rear view mirror. I believe we're in stagflation. So what is stagflation? It means low growth, high mm -hmm. inflation. That's what is stagflation. I believe probably by December, people will admit to, you know what, stagflation started in you know, August, September. So I think we are in that now. To that end, I think stagflation comes first. Okay. Even if it hasn't started yet, I think it's first. And then the question is, what does the Fed do? Yes. What I proposed... I forget which expert interview is, is I think the Fed is going to talk itself into raising rates at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. Hence stagflation, inflation means high inflation. The Fed does what they did in late 2018. They raise into it. They raised one too many times. Real estate screeches to a halt if anybody was around in 2018, late 18. And then um, by the time they realize it, we will already be in a recession. So that's kind of the playbook. It's not a happy playbook to talk about. Uh, but in essence, what it means to us is low rates are going to be around for a while. We may see a little hiccup kind of uh, March, April, May of next year. Um, what we really need to worry about in California is, is it a tech wreck? 
right? Or is it just an ordinary recession where the business cycle retreats? I don't see anything that would lead me to believe a dot-com 2.0 is underway. So I don't see a Silicon Valley or a California-based crash. It's more of a business cycle, right? Uh, uh, you know, manufacturing is starting and stopping and retail and, you know, office and all of these things. And I don't think the economy is nearly as strong as the numbers make it look. So I think a recession is um, right around the corner, actually. And can I have a quick follow-up question yeah. to that? I know you mentioned a lot the 1970s. Yeah. And you mentioned, and if you look back at the stagnation there, we had a halt for two years of real estate. Yeah. Pretty much it was a very um, hard time, if we could say like that. Do you anticipate something like that happening here in a year or two years? Yeah. Not more along the lines as just a slowdown in a recession. A slowdown is certainly what I'm calling for now. We are 5 million units under. The millennials are aging in the home buying I don't see the, um, the the generational trends that would really be a slowdown. Um, it's certainly, po I mean, like a crash, it's certainly possible. But again, you got to remember the 70s also saw a 300 basis point moves in interest rates. I'm not calling anything close to that. Right. I think at the base, I think if interest rates went up one point, like one full point, it would freak people out. Uh, the 70s was, you know, 300 basis points or yeah. three points. So yeah, I think I think the Fed is, I think they painted themselves into a corner and they're stuck for the decade, unfortunately. Got it. Thank you. I appreciate that. No, th good question. Great question, Liz. Love it. Great question. If you guys have any questions, please raise your hand. You just click the reactions down on the bottom of the screen and you're going to uh, raise your hand. Let's go with uh, Mr. Robert. Mr. Robert. Hi, Michael. Thanks for being here. It's always a pleasure and I uh, love your morning uh, briefings. They're always oh. great to listen to. Thank you. Uh, quick question being, so I do some work for uh, an auction company, auction.com. And sure. as, as of last week, they actually, their auction division reached out to say that, hey, that they might be looking at a bunch of foreclosures coming back to the courthouse steps where they weren't having them before. So uh, do you see you know, the, the state of California coming in and kind of putting a stop to those for a while as well, like they did the eviction moratoriums? Um, so a couple of things. First off, everything I've looked at, um, I've seen foreclosures. I saw a couple of reports that foreclosures were up 350%. That sounds crazy until you realize it went from three to 10, right? I mean, seriously, that technically is 350%, but it's three to 10. Um, everything I've seen out there, um, there is going to be no foreclosure wave. Uh, people have equity. I mean, what happened to the average city in California, right? It went up 20%. Even if you bought last year with three and a half percent down, you're sitting on 15, 18, 20%. You're a forced sale, but you're not a foreclosure. Plus all these 40 years and adding seconds, I don't see it. Yes, I think, you know, again, do I, I, I read the Black, a Black Knight is a company that puts out um, foreclosure data. They've been putting out these um, um, foreclosure moratorium stats. It's shocking that nobody reads these. So we peak at about 4.2 million people in forbearance. They've now processed out 2.6 or 2.7 million folks. Do you guys have any idea what percentage of those were de deed in lieu or a short sale? 1%, 1%. 1% of 2.7 million is 27,000. I mean, yeah, okay, so you'll have some. But you, and also let's not forget, anybody that was around in 06 foreclosures in California took 700 to 800 days. Auction.com is not getting a listing for seven or 800 days. Yeah. And then, of course, Gavin Newsom and his boys will fight it and do this or do that. So, no, I don't, I, I'd be shocked if they get any meaningful difference. And again, you know, three is more than zero, but I'd be shocked if it was meaningful. And great. that's for the country, let alone California. Yeah. Great. Well, hey, thanks again for being here. Really appreciate it. Thanks for Ty and for Adrian for bringing you out. So, thanks yeah. again, Mike. Thank you. Question, Robert. Great question. Mr. Terry from Utah. Great. So just out of curiosity, Mike, for the seller finance deals on a little larger multifamily units, what, mm -hmm. what firms are you looking for there? Uh, so price is the last thing I look at. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm First thing I want to understand is the payment. I want the payment to be 40% of gross rents or better. That's kind of my upper limit. Um, then I want term. 
I would prefer uh, no balloon until 10 years. I would prefer 30 year amortization, full amortization. I would accept a 10 year balloon. Uh, I want better than market rates. So I would, you know, I don't, why, why would I go to you, Mr. Seller, if I could get a better rate? And again, I'm trying to save him, him or her taxes. So I would want that. And I want to control the down payment, but price is almost irrelevant. I've, 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 um, I think the most I ever paid was 20% more than I thought something was worth, but I got 0% interest in 30 years. So basically it's a fully amortized loan, zero interest. So I'm sure I'll pay you more now and I'll, you know, I'll get it back on the back end. So, um, for me, it's making sure the payment is something, cause I do every deal to hold forever. So I wouldn't want the mortgage payment to be more than 40% of gross. And that's assuming that gross rents is low. Cause I'll raise rents and have more cup, more cushion. I'd want 10 years minimum, but prefer 30 years. Uh, and then a below market interest rate is what I'd key on in that order. Very cool. Thank you. Hmm? Great question, Terry. Great question. Any other questions for Mr. Zuber? I know we got him. Mr. Angel. What's happening, Michael? Thank you for getting on this call, man. Love all your videos. Love all your shares, man. I feel, I feel stronger every time I watch <laughs> one of your videos. I'm like, oh, I'm ready. I'm I, I know everything now. Awesome. I'm <laughs> Thank you, that. man. Thank you, my man. Hey, do you mind sharing some of your secret sauce? I know earlier you said about, Hey, I'm targeting this, yeah. you know, where you're, where are you getting your data from? If you don't mind sharing the secret sauce, and yeah. then, what does that script sound like? What does that conversation sound like? So I use prop stream is what I use for that. Right. Prop stream is a part of the one rental at a time community. So they give me access to their platform obviously. Uh, so that's what I'm using to generate the list. Uh, I use, I uh, talked to a guy there named Burton who helps me do all of this stuff. I talk to him every other Thursday. Uh, so that's how I do it. And then the script is basically what I go in. I'm, there's no doubt I use my reputation and content and book, right? I have a picture of my book, right? I say, I'm that guy. I've been in Fresno since 2002. People could look up and see my name, right? All my stuff is, wasn't in LLCs all the time, right? So they can see, see that I'm there if they want to check me out. Um, and then I don't ask to buy anything. I actually say, how's the year treated you? I've had a couple of tenants play games. Are you nervous about it? Taxes going up next year? I am. If you're thinking about selling, two landlords should talk. Give me a call. Love that. Love. Great. Great question, Angel. Great. I, yeah. It's just, it's just. Anytime I need a, a quick recap of what's going on, I throw on Michael's videos, and <laughs> plug back in and I'm good to go. So I appreciate that, man. I, uh, you're doing a lot for the community and there's a lot of over givers and we, uh, we, you are one of them and we appreciate that. Oh, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Questions guys. More questions. Just unmute yourself and fire. I, I've got another question, if, if I could. Sure. Um, with the Evergrande, all that going on in China, how much of that do you see spilling over to the U.S.? And what do you see? What do you see that looking like? So the whole contagion question is a very good question, right? The the the, the, the to relate it to what happened in the U.S. is this going to be a Lehman moment? which is what kicked off the Great Recession and contagion and took out AIG and Countrywide and all of that? Or is it going to be like long-term capital management, which some of you may not know what that is. Long-term capital management was essentially the biggest junk bond seller. I think it was in the 80s. You may have heard a name named Michael Milken. He actually went to jail. But basically, long-term capital management right now feels like it's going to be Evergrande to me. And what do I mean by that? Long-term capital management got in trouble over their skis. They couldn't pay their debt. The Fed came in and basically took all the bankers, Goldman, Citi, Bear Stearns, all those people at times, time, sat them in a room and said, you're going to eat that. You're going to eat that. You're going to eat that. And then next day, long-term long -term capital was a blip, never to be heard from again. I think that's what's going to happen in Evergrande. The Chinese central government, which again, they're communist or socialist. I know nothing, but this is what I... What I see them doing is they want to protect the employees and they want to protect the homeowners. They don't give a shit about the bankers. They don't care about outside capital. But if they start liquidating properties, they own like 1.5 million units or just something stupid, they could take down the whole property market. And oh, by the way, the property market in China is 27% of GDP. That'll catch your attention. 
They don't want to see that crash. So my guess is they're going to eventually in the next two to four weeks, they're going to take the next 10 biggest property developers and go, hey, you eat that project, you eat that project, you eat that project. We'll give you debt at 0%. Everybody's good. You won't lose money. But Evergrande, you stop to exist. And in China, they might freaking kill the owners, right? China shoots people, right? Let alone put them in jail. They might kill them, right? Just totally. It, I mean, they do stuff like that. So we'll see. Um, but yeah, I think, I think Evergrande right now is long-term capital management. It's a blip. It's, it's contained. But boy, if they let it go to like, you'll, it'll be a Lehman moment. It, because what's happening right now is outside capital is going, I'm not investing in China. Black, Blackstone canceled a $3 billion deal. All these other firms are going, I'm not putting money in China. Too risky. You, you're going to make me eat. You know, you know it's, you, I'm not, I don't want to take the loss. Or they're going to raise rates. They used to get it at three. Now it's 16, right? They want to they risk adjusted return. So yeah, I don't... Um, they can't, they can't let it, because if they take out this guy and then all the other small ones can't raise capital, the whole property market busts in China's in, China's in trouble. And we have, a, we have a worldwide recession if that happens, because China makes all the stuff, right? So it just, I just don't see it going that way. Great question. Great answer. Yeah. So many. Uh... About China. So question. Yeah, we have, we have all of this material sitting outside of the ports, right? We yeah. have China pulling back on some of the material they were sending us and hiking costs. Yeah. Besides inflation, where else does that play a role? Well, right now, China, I believe, is ruining the reputation. I mean, if you if you look back a year ago, probably actually before this virus thing, right? There was a lot of talk about the U.S. and China jockeying for number one and number two, right? You saw China going out, creating relationships, basically because the U.S. was, you know, pissing everybody off, right? Uh, now what's happening is China's showing their true colors. So I think China is hurting themselves on the global stage. Uh, they're hurting their relationship with Australia. Australia is the largest exporter of goods to China, like raw material. Um, so I think, I think they're hurting their reputation which will mean that the U S looks even stronger. The rule of law wins out. Um, yeah, I just, I think, I think China is hurting themselves on a global stage. And um, I think what's going to happen also is you're going to see a lot more manufacturing come home. It's only started. If you fast forward five years, there will be a lot more manufacturing in the U S let alone Canada, Mexico, other kind of more, you know, closer locations. I think China's years of being the manufacturing engine and the maker of all uh, will, will cease to exist in a decade. They'll always make some things, but I doubt they'll be the maker of everything. Wish I can make myself a little USB chip, plug it into the side of your brain, download all this knowledge, <laughs> slip it into mine and be good to go. <laughs> oh, so good. Thank you. Always, always something new to think about. I appreciate that. Very cool. I love it. I love it. Let's keep it going. More questions. I mean, I have stuff too, but I want to hear from you guys. I get to talk to Michael every week. In fact, two or three times this week, but for everybody here, please, more questions. Just unmute yourself. Go for it, Aaron. Yeah, something. So it's more on a surface level. It's not like so much in depth about the market and all that, but uh, Michael, just curious, like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a future, I, I kind of mess myself up and overthink this whole buying a rental thing by uh, by worrying about my team that's going to be there that I can count on mm -hmm. to work on the houses, be the contractor, uh, you know, the electricians, the, the, the handyman, the people that are going to be helping me through the process. Mm -hmm. I mean, how did you go about setting up your team that you really felt confident with and like just trial and error and all, how all that worked? Yeah, it takes time. I wish I could, I wish there was a secret sauce. There's nowhere to be right. Uh, I fired the first five property managers I had. I've had uh, general contractor, contractor steal from me. I've had people do shoddy work that had to be redone. Um, really what you got to do is just network with other real estate investors in the area. You got to tell everybody what you're doing. Every agent, every closer, every, everybody. You just like one of the, I think it's step four or step five in my course is building your network. You got to meet one new person a day, every day. And it's amazing the spider web that you can create. Uh, but don't overthink it. Just know going in that real estate's a people business. And because it's a people business, unfortunately, people are going to disappoint you. Uh, run a tight ship. I give everybody one chance. 
right? There's always a, okay, tell me what happened kind of thing, but nobody gets two. And I just, I just moved on. And, and again, firing five man, five property managers in five years was not fun uh, for somebody who could have been in a different country when I was doing it. So. Right. Awesome. Well, thank you, Michael. Appreciate mm -hmm. that. Of course. Great question. Great question. Let's keep going. More questions. I have a question, Michael. I have another one. Mm -hmm. um, are you planning to do the same thing you did with your book, selling uh, some of the single family homes and moving into multi family? Or how at, do you see yourself doing that? Look at you. Uh, look at that. Read my book. Awesome. Uh, so what I'm doing right now is I'm going to buy as many residential properties as I can in the next two or three years. I think multifamily, generally speaking, is overpriced. So I'm not playing there. In fact, I sold two apartment buildings in late 19. Uh, so no, I'm buying residential because again, I love 30-year debt. Commercial stuff uh, is A, really low cap rates, which when interest rates go up, cap rates have to go up, which hurts value. So I'm not going to mess with apartments right now. I plan to probably buy houses or residential. So four plexes and below probably for three more years. And then I will definitely 1031 into apartments, probably 20, 2025, 26. I plan to repeat what was in my book, except with a lot more units. Got it. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. I love it. Great question, Liz. More questions. Uh, Michael, just to be clear, you, you mentioned, depending on if this thing gets extended from, uh, I'm going to take this one out of Rogelia's gruesome newsome, mm. right? If this thing gets extended, uh, you're saying somebody with a big lot, uh, approximately 12,000 or, or bigger, 10,000 square foot bigger and four units more than likely would be more open to seller financing. Uh, would you think? No, I guess maybe I, I maybe confused you. So when I'm talking about, so the extension you're referring to, just I'll leave so we're on the same page is the eviction moratorium, right? Correct. Yeah. So what I'm trying to highlight here is that landlords who own property 20 years or more, that's what I want. Why is that? Simply because they're older, right? Just because you've owned for 20 years means you're old, right? You're like my age or older. So I want to talk to that person because they, as you get older, you put up with less shit. It's just do, Right. And oh, by the way, you've owned it long enough where you, your cost basis is this low and you it's this much. And you're like, I'm done. I'm gravity and just done. Forget this newsome guy. I'm going to take my money and go on a cruise ship or whatever they're going to do. That's who I want to talk to. It's not about a fourplex or a 10,000 square foot lot or anything. It's they've owned for 20 years. I want to, I want to talk for me. It's they've owned for 20 years and they own more than one. That's what I want. I want the person who owns more than one. Cause I, I'm very clear. I want to buy, I want to buy the entire portfolio. That's what I want to buy. I want to buy the whole thing. Okay. Thank you for that. Of Just course. need a little clarification. Thank you. No, of course. Sorry. I was not clear. Ali, like, so Michael and I have never discussed that and I never picked up that distinction, but what did we say last week on the mentorship? Um, <laughs> the very, very, essentially the same exact thing. Yeah, because that's going to be your baby boomer, right? Like we yeah. just, it's going to be somebody who's in their late 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, yeah. and they got a lot of equity. Yeah, they don't care about the last little couple of percent. They're like, I, when you trust me, when, when an owner says, I'm done, it, at that point, they're like, it doesn't matter. They're done, right? They want out. So I want to find as many of those people as I can. I love it. I love it. More questions. I think this is, I want to make sure you, as a group, you guys get what you need out of this call. We have Michael here. We have time for a few more questions. Go for it, Zach. Yeah, um, I actually have a question and we tried to do a subject too in regards to property that was trying to be purchased. And one of her main concerns was she was actually taking a look at, oh, okay, well over the 10 years for the balloon, uh, it seems like you're just making the payments to uh, that are equivalent to what I would rent it at. And then over the appreciation, I would make more than what interest rate that I have. So I was curious to know, like, is there anything that you say about that other than like, hey, we just take it over and you don't have to worry about it or. So I would... just want, yeah, I just want to be clear. I have yet to do a subject two, although I expect to do lots of subject twos if we get in a recession, right? Or, uh, uh, yeah, sorry. That's okay. That's no big deal. I, I understand, right? I'm just, I, I always tell people what I've done versus what I think, right? So I haven't done a subject two yet. I know how to do them. I expect to do a lot of them in the next recession because the 30-year debt's going to be awesome. 
but to that end. Um, so basically what the seller is telling you is, hey, you're helping me out from underneath this debt. Uh, I Basically what she's saying is I can either give it to you or I, or she could be the landlord is what she's saying. And if she stays a landlord, she gets the equity. If she does it with you, she doesn't. That's basically what she's saying. Mm -hmm. So your job is to remind her that being a landlord sucks. Got That's it. what you need to remind her. Landlords suck. What happens if they don't pay? What happens if something breaks? What happens if this? What happens if that? Yeah, what she's doing is looking at the equity, not realizing that um, being a landlord is terrible, right? That's what I, that's the story I'd be telling her. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. Spot on. Great answer. And, and I want to just, I want to encapsulate this in what Michael really shared. He talked about landlords. He talked about absentee owners. He talked about them being old and grumpy and just kind of sick and tired, right? Mm -hmm. One of the big things that, that what Michael's describing and then the difference also in Zach's question where the person's like, well, why would I do that? I should just hold on to the property and keep the appreciation. Here's why. Here's the difference between those two scenarios. It's the threshold. It's the emotional threshold. Michael's describing somebody who's hit the emotional threshold that basically, excuse my language, I'm sick and tired of this bullshit. Yep. I'm sick and tired of the tenants. I'm sick and tired of the government. I'm sick and yep. tired of the state. I'm sick and tired of the governor. I'm sick and tired of, you know, the eviction, you know, more, all of it. So, that's what we're really looking for. So think about, you know, that's why he's describing somebody who's owned it for a long time. Demographically, they're older. And on top of it, also, they have that equity margin that they're not like what Michael said. I love you said it so well. They're not trying to squeeze out that last little 10% of the equity, or they're just trying to get every penny out of the deal. Mm -hmm. If they're trying to squeeze every penny out of the deal, that's not the ideal seller doesn't mean we can still list them, mm, yeah. right? We can still convert them into a listing and a paycheck, but really, you know, it's, it's somebody who's hit emotional threshold. Yeah. Well said. I love it. Let's keep going. More questions. Uh, Robert, you had your hand up. You're moving around. Go for it, Robert. Yeah. So, Hey, Michael, going back to your um, talk about, you know, it's a different market, even just from last month. Uh, so we sold a house last month on the market beautiful home custom home gone in a day basically another home same price point just as nice in that same neighborhood you know it took us you know three weeks to put that home under contract but same same home not not that much different uh, what do you say to those potential people who are sitting thinking about selling but they're just kind of sitting on the fence how do you describe that that gap and what's taking place in the market to to help them you know go to sell the property now well, I, again, I always believe in being um, given, giving everything that I think. So what I would tell them is, you, you know, what I would actually go in and say something like, just so you know, August, April and August are two different months and we have a totally different cycle. So if, you, if you're hoping that I'm going to list this property and we're going to have an offer in 24 hours, I want you to know that it's not April. August days on market did this, they did that. Um, so I would start setting the expectations day one that we need to wait at least two weeks before we judge anything. Okay. Uh, I would start right up front because the last thing you want to do is get a listing and start getting phone calls three days later, screaming at you for doing this or that wrong. It starts with that first meeting. And oh, by the way, I would tell them that other listing agents are going to probably come in and lie to you. Yeah. And I would, I would give them the numbers and say, it's August, not April. People coming in, quoting this, quoting that, dropping appraisal conditions, 50K over. Sorry, it's not April. We have 30% more inventory. We, you know, buyers, you know, buyer pools are down 50% and uh, it just starts right up front. Great. Thank you so much. Set that expectation. Appreciate it. I love it. I love it. Love it. Thank you, Michael. Thank you everybody for your participation and questions. Here's the thing. I know everybody, how many of you guys have the book? A lot of you have the book. Look, see, there goes all I the- I just ordered it right now. So it's nice. on order. Yeah. <laughs> Take a picture of this, literally. I want you guys to post. Take a picture of the book and post it and, and, and tag Michael and tell everybody what a great job he's done and what a great, you know, Thank how you. much he contributes. That's so, so nice please take a picture of this. Take a picture of the book, post it, and tag him at one rental at a time, either Facebook or Instagram. Let's, let's give him so that he can build his following. Michael, you got the new book coming out. When is the new book going to release? I'm thinking we're going to release it first week of October. Yeah. First week of October. Who would like to, yeah, who would like to get some of that, right? 
tell them what, what is the book? Tell them a little bit about what the book's going to be. Basically, so the original book, One Rental at a Time, was simply Olivia and I's story of how we went from one house to financial freedom, right? What I've done because of this channel or the YouTube channel is I've interviewed uh, lots of successful real estate investors. So this next book is going to be 15 Conversations with Millionaires, all starting at different points, all getting to different points. Um, yeah, so it's going to be 15 conversations with other successful real estate investors that went from nothing to something. Uh, so there's just more stories. The whole idea was to give people confidence that says that person started in worse shape than I did and they got there. So I have no excuses or that person's like me or they're not so smart. I'm better than them. So uh, now you're going to have 15 uh, other people to look at and go, wow, that's that's pretty cool. I love it. I love it. So we're going to do something special. I haven't figured it out, but for our audience, maybe, Michael, what we'll do is once we launch the book, Maybe after everybody who buys the book, because it's going to be on pre-sale on Amazon, mm -hmm. um, first week of October, and we'll announce it and I'll send everybody a message on it. Thank but you. I want to do something special to maybe where if you buy the pre-sale book, then maybe I will can twist Michael's arm and have him do a special coaching call just for those people that bought the book, sure. right? Something like that. Yeah. So, um, but we really want to promote. If you guys get a lot of value Thanks. out of today's call, Please support Michael, follow him at One Rental at a Time on YouTube. He's got the best financial content, best real estate news, best everything, every category. He checks the box on YouTube. Thank you. It's really, honestly, the only real estate content that I digest and take on out of YouTube. So everything else is entertaining. Yeah. To be honest. I get it. I get it. <laughs> so Michael, thank you so much for all you do, guys. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Thank you for all your participation. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. Bye.